Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome back to a series of unfortunate reviews. If you've been with me since the start of this thing, you've undoubtedly grasped the basic concept of what I'm doing here. If you're just joining me for the first time, I would suggest starting at the bad beginning beginning. 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 There's the thing. Please take note of this spoiler warning, it might apply to later episodes and books than this one, so no complaining if you stick around and I blurt out something from much later on. Okay, as usual, let's recap the book loyal stuff first. The kids arriving in VFD, the incredibly flat, incredibly isolated, incredibly crow infested town they chose to go and live in because they assumed because of its name that it was connected to the VFD the Quagmire triplets yelled out to them as they were being kidnapped. Discovering that the place is run by a group of power mad senior citizens known as the Village Elders who have, over the years come up with almost 20,000 strict, unfair, and sometimes contradictory rules that are rigidly enforced. Finding out the residents of VFD had only agreed to become their new multiple guardians because they wanted someone to do all the chores around the village for them. Hector, the town skittish, overworked, Mexican food-loving handyman being assigned the job of doing all the actual guardianship over them. Very unexpectedly finding that one of Isadora Quagmire's couplets had floated down from the large tree of crows outside Hector's house. Hector showing them his secret library full of forbidden books, his laboratory full of forbidden tools and his self-sustaining hot air mobile home, his means to escape the town and live forever in the sky once it's completed. Working for everyone, doing everything, finding more poems, being told that Count Olaf had finally been captured, finding out that the man they had in custody was not in fact Count Olaf, but as usual no one believing a word they say, the orphans trying to rescue this mysterious Jack character, but being too late because he'd been murdered during the night by Count Olaf, who is now pretending to be a detective investigating the murder he just committed and framing the Baudelaire for it. The kids being convicted on little to no evidence and sentenced to death via burning at the stake, Olaf telling them that he plans to steal one of them away and let the other two die, and them figuring out the poems were hints that the quagmires were imprisoned inside the town's fountain. Busting out of jail and finding them there, attempting to board Hector's self-sustaining hot air mobile home, but only the quagmires making it due to the unfortunate addition of Esme's harpoon gun into the equation, and the Baudelaire's heading off into the sunset to start their new lives as wanted criminals. I'm still a bit put off by Neil Patrick Harris giving away potential spoilers in the theme song at the start of every episode. It's probably fun for the book readers, and I usually like it when shows experiment with new things, but are they really not concerned about fresh audiences at all? While I would have to say that this episode was as equally off book as all the others so far, in this case almost all the stuff they expanded on was in the Olaf B plot, which I guess I can't even call the B plot anymore as I'm pretty sure it took up more than half the episode. Anyway, the point is, this left the Orphan's original book plot relatively unchanged. I think the only major deviations was them trying to rescue Jacques via a mechanical device instead of utilising mob mentality, and the way they broke out of the jail cell, which, oddly enough, are both changes I kind of liked because the way it went down in the book was kind of stupid. This book was probably easier for the showrunners to work with because it's one of those ones where Olaf turns up really, really late in the story, so they had a free hand to do anything they wanted with him before that point. I've been wondering how the fuck they planned to handle this one the second that Nathan Fillion identified himself as Jack Snicket. He doesn't look like Olaf at all, and they were playing him up to be a total badass, so I just couldn't see him getting taken prisoner so easily, or dragged around by Esme, or casually murdered by Olaf. I have to admit, including several showdowns between him and Olaf, Olaf gluing a unibrow to his forehead, and him eventually getting brought down because he tried to give Olaf a chance to redeem himself, did address all of these issues. That was some good adapting. On a related note, apparently I need to go and watch Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog now, because I thought Neil Patrick Harris and Nathan Fillion had remarkable chemistry in this, so I'm actually kind of annoyed they didn't give them any scenes together until until right before they axed Jack Snickered off. I was of the opinion that the hyper antics of Mr. Poe were one of the few new additions to the show that I actually found amusing and approved of, but gosh darn it, they finally overplayed him. To make matters worse, he's not even supposed to be in this story, or at least the parts of the episode covered. I mean, they put the scene where the kids chose to go to the VFD town at the end of the Ursat's elevator. I mean, they got there by travelling by bus and walking a great deal of distance on foot. While I have stated my belief in the past that Mr. Poe is the true villain of the story because of his continuous habit of putting the children children in danger through his incompetence and never listening to them, I would say that him abandoning them to be burnt alive and not doing anything to help them and showing zero remorse about this as soon as he's left the fucking room is a bit too much. I did like the little fucking hell I'm so tired of Mr. Poe's shit look that Violet and Klaus exchanged in the car right at the start, that was well timed and performed. I am becoming frustrated again with things like the eye window in the bar and the suggestion that it used to be a VFD outpost. The town is named VFD coincidentally because it's the 
village of foul devotees, but apparently now it's also connected to the other VFD, the Volunteer Fire Department. I thought that now the books had caught up and started introducing the VFD stuff, the show would chill a little bit, but no. Everything has to be VFD. That's VFD. She's VFD. Everything's VFD! Wow, those, uh... Those flags, I mean, I get that it's intentional, but I just didn't get a Nazi vibe from the Vile Village. I mean, intentional isolation, hatred of technology and new things, burning at the stake, it's all way more Spanish Inquisition than fascism. Oh my goodness, I suspected the Spanish Inquisition. No one suspects the Spanish Inquisition! Okay, settle in, my beautiful watchers, because I'm about to talk about Hector for a surprising amount of time. Netflix either intentionally or unintentionally changed the fundamental nature of his main character trait quite severely. In the show, he's basically just Josephine again, you know, terrified of everything, but with the added feature that he dramatically faints when he's put under pressure. It's hinted that he is this way because he's traumatized by the time that his mother was punished by the town for rule infringement. He does, however, through great effort, find the courage to speak up in the orphan's defense when they're first accused of murder, though it doesn't do them any good. Now, none of this is necessarily a problem because he's still a reasonably well-rounded and funny character, but I do think it's a slight shame because Hector's problem manifests itself very differently in the books. He doesn't get flustered or faint, he just cannot speak a word to the elders no matter how hard he tries. This includes when the orphans appeal to him for help in clearing their name. Even though he can seem perfectly calm and confident when he's back home or in small groups of friends, no matter how much he wants to help or stand up for himself, Book Hector involuntarily freezes up in crowds or when he's faced with people he finds intimidating. He can only stand up to the elders at long last when he's up in his airship, separated from the crowd and the situation by an insurmountable distance of empty air. This led me to believe that even though the world around him is still cartoonish and silly, Hector himself was a very realistic, and I would say sympathetic, portrayal of someone with overpowering social anxiety. Hector himself uses the word skittish over and over instead of anxious, but the symptoms seem to match. Though that said, I am by no means an expert on anxiety, so take all this for what it's worth, and I'm also very aware that anxiety issues don't manifest themselves the same way for everyone. Maybe I'm overthinking it, I don't know, but if it's not, and that was what Handler was going for, making Hector an over-the-top comedic coward instead just seems like a shame to me, it might have been some good representation otherwise. If nothing else, it's harder to imagine this new version of him disobeying orders to save the mechanical devices in the books he was ordered to destroy. Moving on, Olaf seems to be more into Esme now, and they're clearly using dancing as an allegory for sex, which I would usually be okay with, but because they established in the last episode that Esme wanted actual sex and Olaf suggested dancing instead, I'm just left still thoroughly confused as to the Count's sexual preferences. In the book, the Elder's hats just look kind of crow-like, as opposed to having actual stuffed crows on them. It was harder to take their claims to fanatical crow protection seriously when they were wearing three of their corpses strapped to their heads. I mean, I guess those crows could have died of old age, but still. While the Netflix orphans recognized Esme immediately, the book versions of them did not, despite her using several of her signature catchphrases. Combine this with them not recognizing the hook-handed doorman in the last book, and the thought occurs that Handler did undermine the adults equal dumb, kids equal smart theme that the fans seem to be so keen on by making it just Olaf they could instantly recognize. I'm not sure why Jack and Olivia felt the need to dress up as cowboys when they first got into town. I mean, there doesn't seem to be much point to it, and that's not even necessarily the theme of the town. Some of the townsfolk look like they're going for more of an Amish chic. There were multiple jokes in this about a donkey. I mean, I guess it was kind of a cute donkey. Actually, fuck it, I wish we'd seen more of the donkey. I like the donkey. Let's change the show's focus and rename it a series of donkey events. All in favor? Nevermore Tree was a bit of a letdown. I mean, it's described in the book as being the biggest tree the orphans had ever seen, and the damn thing was CGI anyway, so why make it so normal-sized in the show? Same thing with the self-sustaining hot air mobile home. I mean, I guess it looks nice in the show, but you'll never be able to convince me that that thing is holding enough food to sustain six people indefinitely. I mentioned that I liked the directing in the last episode. Well, this time it's the score that really impressed me. There were some tunes in this that were really emotional and effective. I'm pretty sure I saw Sonny reacting to an innuendo at one point in this pair of episodes, which is a little uncomfortable making. I was a tad confused by the noose in the deluxe jail cell, partly because the town's method of capital punishment was burning at the stake, and partly because it was clearly too close to the ground to actually hang someone. Okay, I have to admit, the show got me good with that joke about how, after all that build-up, Hector's mother's punishment turned out to have just been her having to pay a fine and then moving away and starting a business. I didn't see it coming, 
morning, and I love the fact that it was a joke specifically aimed at people who had read the books, because if you hadn't, there's no real reason why you would assume that she'd been executed, because they don't bring up the stake burnings until much later, because apparently in the show's version of reality, VFD just fined people for rule infringement, and didn't have any inclination towards fiery death until Olaf suggested it. I'm currently still finding the theatre troupe henchmen reasonably amusing, so I don't mind that they're all still being used in every episode, which, as I mentioned in the last series, flies in the face of the books where Olaf would traditionally only work with one at a time, or I guess technically two in the case of the twins. I thought that they built up the Olaf Snicket courtroom switcheroo quite well. I had assumed that it would be ruined by the Jack subplot they've been pushing so hard, but they did successfully integrate it into the new story, so the misdirection still paid off. I'm not entirely sure why Olaf felt he needed to do his hair too, but I guess it was kind of funny. The evidence against the children was much more convincing in the show, and that's both good and bad depending on how you look at it. I mean, it ties in better and seems more believable, but the lack of that was kind of the point in the books. It showed just how dumb and easily led the townsfolk were, and just how ready they were to turn on the newcomers when all Olaf had to do was hold up a ribbon and say, this is hers, for them to convict them. Space Folding Bicycle Paperboy is back, although this time he's also, quite amusingly, obviously muscular stuntman Bicycle Boy too. Murder Happy Olaf once again does nothing to harm Larry your waiter despite having him at his mercy. I'm starting to think that maybe he has feelings for him or something. The show's habit of lampshading book inconsistencies continues, as Esme points out that seeing as she's already insanely wealthy, Olaf really doesn't need to keep trying to steal the various orphans' fortunes, but it's now apparently a matter of pride, revenge, obsession, whatever. I knew even before I watched the episode that they were going to have to adjust the method of escape the orphans utilise to get out of the deluxe jail cell. The idea of pouring water on a wall, soaking it with bread, and then pouring it on the wall again, resulting in enough erosion to break it down after just a few hours is just a little too stupid even for this show. It was weirdly circular seeing Neil Patrick Harris, a very handsome man, wearing a ton of makeup to make himself look ugly, insisting that he's handsome. The books were never exactly grounded in solid reality, but I think there was an unmistakable increase in surrealism with every one. The show started out much more silly, but I was kind of hoping when they reached the midway point the turn of the books would have caught up a little bit, but the show has also shown a steady increase in ridiculous levels, so it's maintaining its lead and will probably continue to do so. Okay, so so there's this dramatic moment at the end of this book where the Baudelaire's realise that they're going to have to become fully self-sufficient because they're now wanted by the law for a crime they didn't commit and they have to abandon Mr. Poe's care and fend for themselves and as a symbolic representation of this new self-reliance, Sunny stands up and takes her first baby steps unassisted. Because in the show the actress had grown up between seasons and had been walking for ages now, I guess they decided they needed to find a new big life moment for her to take instead. I might not have jumped all the way to driving a vehicle. Uh, maybe just have her say her first coherent sentence instead. No? Definitely going with a fire truck. Okay. I'm not even sure why they even bothered trying to get on board the self-sustaining hot air mobile home if they already had transport available. I mean, they were already iffy on the subject of spending the rest of their lives up in the sky anyway, so why not just keep driving like they end up doing when it all goes wrong and then the quagmires and the Baudelaire's would have been together. In conclusion, I don't know if it's because this was a genuinely better book and episode than the others so far, or if it was the Harris Fillion scenes, or the really good soundtrack, or I've just been trapped doing this for so long Stockholm Syndrome has finally started to set in, but... I am finding myself hating this significantly less than before. Don't celebrate too soon, my beautiful watchers. I'm still a long way from liking it, but it's a start, I guess. Thanks for watching, and once again, if you'd be so good as to subscribe, share, and get to know that like button, you'd be doing me a huge favour, as that's still insanely important to appease the algorithm god of YouTube that holds my fate in its incomprehensible hands. See you soon. What up, beautiful watchers, and welcome back to the other YouTubers I think you might like thing that I'm doing. Okay, so, this guy right here, Ryan Hollinger, certainly doesn't need a shout-out because he's already got a very successful channel, but I dig his work, so I'm including him in this anyway. Ryan is a film and TV show reviewer and video essayist who specialises in highly analytical retrospectives. He covers a variety of genres, though it seems to hold a soft spot for horror movies and the symbolism hidden within- Ah, stop-motion animation, be gone, I'll have none of you! <clears throat> um, he's a YouTuber who continuously finds the elusive balance between entertainment, informative, and subtle humour. Links in the description, check out his channel if you haven't already.